this will be her last deep dive for us. Um, this is her last week as an iSelect Venture Analyst. She is a tremendous opportunity to uh, join or to uh, attend Vanderbilt Medical School um, and also be part of an entrepreneurship program down there simultaneously. So we're looking forward to great things out of her there and appreciate the hard work she's put in and um, know she's very happy to have this be your last deep dive. But I will uh, t- I'll turn it over to Hannah. And thank you all very much for attending today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Craig. I'm, I'm really excited and have loved having the opportunity at, at iSelect. Um, so kind of to, to jump into the deep dive, thank you all for joining today. Um, I'm Hannah Hund, an analyst on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm really excited to walk you all through today's presentation and findings. For those new to these webinars, iSelect is an early stage venture capital firm in St. Louis, Missouri, focused primarily on early stage companies in healthcare and agriculture. At iSelect, we're privileged to live at the forefront of innovation, seeing emerging problems, solutions, and macro trends at their beginning before they make their way into popular culture. Excuse me. We use these deep dive presentations not only as a way for us to better engage with and understand new science and technology, but also to engage with the experts and entrepreneurs who are driving change and innovation in their respective fields. One topic that we've been researching is wearables and digital health. Wearables are wearable technology that are designed to collect data on users' personal health. There are many different applications for wearables and they can measure many things, including heart rate, activity, muscle contraction, and hydration, among many others. Wearables are valuable because of their potential to help manage patients' lifestyles and chronic disease. Data from wearables can also help us to unlock knowledge on disease progression and enable clinical trials. Insights gained from this data and the impact it has on disease could represent a huge decrease in the cost of our healthcare system and improve the quality of patients' lives. However, getting to this future will require methods to remove noise from data streams, consumer, physician, and payer buy-in, and clear data privacy requirements. For these reasons, and many others which we will cover in today's webinar, wearables are of increasing interest to iSelect. A few process comments. We are not soliciting investment or giving investment advice in any way whatsoever. This presentation is general industry research based on publicly available information. We've invited you to this because you are technologists, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, industry experts, early adopter customers, or sophisticated investors that are part of the iSelect network. We value your thoughts, questions, comments, and insights into this topic, and would greatly appreciate it if you actively engage during the presentation. Thank you in advance for your attendance and active participation. We ask that you put yourself on mute for the time being. However, We hope for this to be an engaging and interactive presentation. So if you have questions or comments, please feel free to unmute yourself to ask a question or provide commentary at any time. This presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. And with that, I'm pleased to bring you this week's deep dive on wearables in healthcare. Thank you all for joining today. We'll start out with a summary of today's findings and an introduction to our great solution providers. After, I'll give a background on the trends in wearable technology. We'll jump into a discussion with our solution providers and finish with our considerations going forward. Um, Thank you everyone for, for joining. Uh, Could each of you give a 30-second introduction over yourself? I think we'll start from the the left side and head to the right. But let me make sure that I've enabled everyone to talk. I think I have, so you should be able to unmute yourself. Um, Bob, could we we start with you? Could you give a little 30-second introduction? Sure. I'm Bob Frank. I am uh, an entrepreneur and cardiac surgeon. I started Avid Heart uh, three years ago with my partner, uh, we have uh, built and we're starting to market outside of the U.S. a handheld heart monitor, which monitors heart rate, heart rhythm, pulse oximetry, and uh, skin temperature. We also have a, uh, a million-dollar grant from the National Science Foundation to transfer that technology to a wearable that firefighters will wear to help decrease uh, the very high incidence of cardiac mortality that firefighters suffer on scene. 
Thanks, Bob. Jim? Hi, I'm Jim Howard. I'm the CEO of Readout Health in St. Louis. We're a digital biomarker research and, uh, and manufacturer, and we've uh, cracked the code on breath technology to detect compounds in the breath, essentially, um, organic compounds. So we've uh, focused on the first product called Biosense. We launched that just recently in the consumer academic research and clinical space, and it tracks your level of fat burn throughout the day and provides that to clinics as well as uh, individuals that are seeking some type of weight loss protocol. Thank you, Jim. Meredith? I'm Meredith Unger, um, founder of NYX. Uh, we have a hydration sensor um, patch-based uh, form factor that quantifies fluid losses and electrolyte losses in real time. Uh, we'll be launching in the athlete category to start um, at every level of play from youth through professional, uh, but have a forward-looking uh, focus on um, occupational health, including military, um, as well as firefighters and others. Bob, we should chat. Um, uh, but also, um, you know, agricultural construction working um, and so on. Great. Thanks, Meredith. Alex? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Alex Winter. We um, just started Norbert Health about uh, nine months ago. Uh, Norbert Health is originally a um, contactless so ambient sensor for elderly people who live home alone. So it detects heart rate, breathing rate when they walk by, uh, temperature. Uh, it also detects falls and uh, unusual movements as well as sleep quality using mostly radar sensors that, that basically cover a whole home going through walls. Um, more recently, we've uh, started to look at applications in uh, your return to work systems where you want to monitor the health of employees going back to the office or members of co-working spaces and things like that. Thanks, Alex. Blake? Sure. Thanks, Hannah. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Blake Margraff. Um, I uh, uh, founded and run CareSignal based here in St. Louis. CareSignal is focused on helping keep some of the most challenging patient populations, especially those with chronic conditions, engaged in a clinically relevant way. Um, and we sell our software as a service to uh, uh, healthcare providers and payers across the country and help them engage more than 20,000 patients on any given day. Thanks, Blake. And, and finally, Thomas. Hi, Thomas. Um, in Sweden, I'm from Cross Technology, founder of the company, and we are a healthcare platform using sensor data, working with all types of chronic disease and long-term conditions that needs to be tracked. And we have uh, been awarded uh, a lot of prizes actually for what we are doing. So hi to you all. Great, thanks Thomas. And thank you all for joining. I'm, I'm really excited to jump in to discussion with you. Um, but first I'm gonna do a little summary and, and give a little background to set the stage for our discussion today. Perfect. Well, according to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, healthcare spending is projected to grow about 1% faster than our GDP through at least 2027, which raises healthcare share of United States GDP from about 18% in 2018 to more than 19.5%. And, um, and there, are, there are many factors at play from insurance interests to federal spending guidelines and many more. But a major factor is the increasing prevalence of chronic disease. Heart disease, diabetes, and chronic obesity are on the rise. And according to some estimates, the care of patients with at least one chronic condition accounts for 85% of all healthcare spending, with 71% of that spending on patients with more than one chronic condition. To reduce the cost of healthcare, we need to start by working to prevent chronic diseases. We're living in a world where we can measure and track our bi biology, whether that's through tests at the doctor's office or by using wearable devices and other platforms to measure our health at home. But why is it important to track our health? For example, we know that if we can catch and treat many cancers early enough in their development, we can cure them before significant damage is done. 
then the cancer doesn't get the chance to proceed to deadly later stages. And if we don't have late stage cancer anymore, it becomes a more manageable condition with fewer deaths. The data from wearable devices and the actions taken with this data is a tremendous opportunity to improve health outcomes, prevent disease progression, and decrease overall cost of care. Um, to start, I'd like to give you a little definition that I've been using for wearable devices that may be helpful for today's presentation. Wearables that we'll be talking about fall in kind of two camps, one being consumer wearables like Fitbit um, and other being wearable medical devices. Consumer wearables are not regulated by the FDA while the wearable medical devices are prescribed by a healthcare provider and require FDA clearance or approval to be used. Jumping into the market, according to Markets and Markets, the healthcare wearables market is expected to reach 46.6 billion by 2025, up from eight, about 18 and a half billion this year with a compounded annual growth rate of about 20% in these next five years. Analysts also project that 500 million wearable devices will be shipped in 2023, up from 300 million in 2019, and just about 100 million in 2016. And this demonstrates an increase in consumer demand for wearables and personal biometrics data. In general, we've seen a large uptick in technology usage since 2016 in healthcare, from wearables, EHR, to remote monitoring, moder monitoring excuse me. What do customers and patients consider when adopting wearables specifically? An empirical study published by Emerald Insight looked into determining the factors in wearable technology acceptance in healthcare. And they actually broke the, the users into two categories. One was fitness wearable users and the other was medical device users. They found that people focused on fitness devices or applications cared about achieving their goals, the device functionality, the social influence that they perceived it would bring them, um, as well as perceived privacy risk and the vulnerability it would require of the user. Um, whereas the medical device users were motivated to use devices based on their personal ability to run the device, the amount of effort they perceived would be required, and then also the perceived severity of their own condition. So consumers really cared about achieving their fitness goals um, and their privacy risk, while patients worried about how badly they needed the measurement and how much work they, they, the device would require. And I think this, the interplay between these factors is really interesting. When we think about how to design devices and biosensors that could potentially play important roles in both consumer and medical grade markets. Um, wearables, in addition to providing insights into the health of an individual to guide healthcare decisions, are also providing a new data feed for insurance companies that could inform the pricing of premiums and coverage limits. Um, some insurance providers are beginning to require a data feed from policyholders' devices in order to provide coverage. John Hancock uh, actually stopped selling traditional life insurance and is only marketing interactive policies that record the exercise activities and health data of customers through either a Fitbit or Apple Watch. Insurance companies, employers, and others have also begun promoting healthy lifestyles and creating rewards by having beneficiaries use wearable devices that can record physical activity and calorie intake. So what has been, what has the data said so far about the health outcomes of wearables? So the studies that, that I read have had some kind of mixed results. They have differed depending on the market focus and technology. Studies that I, that I saw have shown significant benefits from the use of wearables, especially in remote patient monitoring systems. One example of which found about a 50% reduction in hospital readmissions among a population of 1,000 patients with chronic conditions. The conditions most commonly addressed using this type of monitoring include sleep apnea, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, and cancer. Uh, uh, otherwise, in the consumer health space, I saw a few studies that, that had kind of a different report on the success of products. 
One systematic review that was published in the American Journal of Medicine last December found that current literature evaluating Fitbit or health apps indicate little benefit of the devices on chronic disease health outcomes. They found that Wearable fitness devices may play a role as a facilitator in motivating and accelerating physical activity, but the data do not suggest other consistent health benefits. Um, and then another study concluded that wearable devices are useful in helping patient and clinicians create a plan of care and track outcomes. Um, for example, um, they found that Wearable devices are helping to promote self-management for people in chronic conditions. Um, they, they, they see that these programs can provide instant feedback patterns and show progress uh, that can easily be shared with a healthcare provider. And then additionally, wearables, um, they think are likely more helpful when paired with other resources or tools, such as a health coach, a personal trainer, healthcare provider, or wellness program. While we're on this topic, I'm really curious kind of to, to phone the audience here. What trends have you been seeing in the utilization of data in, in wearable devices? Well, maybe not, but I, I guess we'll, we'll jump into that, into that later. Um, next, I'm going to jump in over here and let's let's dive into to some discussion with our solution providers. Uh, just to give you a little framework for for how I broke this down, we have lots of great perspectives on wearables represented today. Um, from the perspective of medical grade wearables, consumer wearables, and and some other platforms that are that are supporting wearable technology. I think that sometimes there's a little overlap between these medical grade and consumer. So um, if you feel like I categorized, categorized you wrong, uh, this is pretty loose. Um, but in general, I, I think as we, we look at jumping into this conversation, I wanna encourage everyone, if you, if you have any question as we talk to each of you, feel free to ask questions of one, one, one another, whether you join the call as a participant or a solution provider. Um, and, and take this chance to really learn from different perspectives. But first I'd like to, to, to do a spotlight on Avid Heart. Um, Bob, if you're there, I think it'd be great if you could give a, a short intro background on Avid Heart. Um, and then I'd also love if you could dive into why you were seeking um, medical, de medical device approval over maybe going a direct consumer path. So oh, great, thank you so much. So as I, as I said in my, my 30 second introduction, um, we are, we're handheld device. We have AI powered uh, rhythm diagnosis. Right now we can diagnose bradycardia, tachycardia, and normal sinus rhythm and AFib with a very high degree of accuracy. Um, we kind of live in a straddling world right now. Um, initially our device and our competitors were always deemed by the FDA as medical devices and need to be prescribed devices. So the initial model for our device was for it to be able to be purchased by a consumer, but locked. And the first EKG had to be unlocked by a physician reading it and we would provide that service. Then one morning I woke up and the Apple Watch was doing EKGs and diagnosing AFib. And what had happened was that, the, that Apple had gotten a de novo ruling from the FDA that said that they could have a device that could diagnose AFib and it could be available over the counter, still counting as a medical device. So as we go to market in the United States, we're kind of pursuing um, both routes. So we are getting FDA approval for our device as a prescribed device, simultaneously doing the consumer studies essentially that will allow us to petition to be an over-the-counter device. So I, I think we kind of perfectly straddle the conversation that you are having between a consumer device and a prescribed device. So we will essentially be an over-the-counter medical grade device. Great, thanks, thanks Bob. And what are there any additional claims that you can make if you seek approval that you maybe couldn't if you were consumer only? 
Yes, the FDA is is is, is having basically their concerns are we you know we didn't split the atom here. Uh, we've taken technologies that are available but combined them into a single device, and that has been a little perturbing for the FDA. Um, it would be much easier for us to get any one of these data strands data streams across. So we will be a de novo reflective pulse oximetry solution. So the FDA has approved over-the-counter pulse oximetry. It is very confusing the way they do it, um, which is probably not for this conversation. But the, the combination of the three data streams together is kind of the thing that is perplexing the FDA a little bit. And they wonder how consumers will be able to digest these very complicated things of temperature, pulse oximetry, and heart rate and rhythm. Yeah, and I, and I understand you've also been a part of some other mar markets around the world. Can you mm -hmm. speak a little bit to, um, I guess, maybe the challenges you've seen in those markets or, or sure. maybe lack thereof of challenges? Yeah, sure. So be not quite so randomly, my partner's from Sri Lanka, so we had some access to Sri Lanka and India. So we have started to sell the device in Sri Lanka and India Mostly, it's been focused on government purchases, it looks like. We tried to go through a consumer route. We partnered with a, uh, a large telecom um, in Sri Lanka, and they have stores that are sort of like the Apple stores, but we just weren't getting a lot of traction out of that. And we've really now, especially with the, the, the pandemic crisis, have really presented ourselves as a solution to, um, to the government, to Ministry of Health and such and uh, have started to get some good traction there. Uh, similarly, in India, um, we've gotten some, some very good traction. We have a couple pipeline deals um, that are pending right now. Um, again, institutional healthcare. So the Indian Navy has its own um, uh, string of hospitals and they care for the members of the Navy exclusively. So you know they're very interested. Um, we've also been looking to integrate into other platforms. So we've had about a year long conversation with Infosys, who is now um, integrating our hardware and software um, into their platform. We've also um, started selling in South America. We've got a, a, a foothold in Peru and we've uh, developed a distributorship there and also uh, are starting. Um, we have some interest in Europe and we're talking to a pharmaceutical company that wants to distribute us um, in Europe. The challenges obviously are different everywhere. Uh, getting FDA approval goes a long way to solving most of those. Um, certainly in Asia, it's a little bit easier. Um, Sri Lanka had its own FDA essentially that we were approved by. In India, it, again, it's easy to get the device to sell, but most of the providers, especially when you talk to you know, big providers, like for example, Apollo Health, they really only want devices that are FDA approved. Um, so it, that, that has been um, a little bit interesting for us as well. Yeah, thanks for providing that perspective. That's really interesting. Um, have you, I guess one other, one other question that I have is just, have you had any challenges with alarm fatigue for healthcare professionals? I, I think you'd mentioned that your devices is, can push data to your healthcare professionals. I, I guess I wonder how you handle that. Sure, so there's, there's really two ways that we handle it. Um, for example, a consumer can designate who is gonna get their results, but there's nothing that's sent automatically on the consumer device that way. So for example, if, if I had a, an episode of AFib, I can manually send it to my physician. I drop, you know, I have drop down my contacts and I can send a PDF of the entire rhythm strip. The other way that we have it set up is for a provider that has patients on multiple devices. So Dr. Smith is a cardiologist and has 20 patients on the device. We have a portal that that physician would then go to and open up and can see, you know, all 20 patients and, you know, in kind of a typical uh, stoplight fashion can see who has had arrhythmias. The physicians can set that up to be to have push notifications if they want to set it up that way we've we've kind of been more hands off you know we don't want to be an emergency device we we don't diagnose deadly arrhythmia so we specifically stay away from things like ventricular tachycardia and the things that actually kill people because that's really not the space that we're in so the arrhythmias that we detect 
are not something that is are not things that are um, death defying at the time that they're discovered. So the time sensitivity isn't there. It's really more important that they're identified. Atrial fibrillation in particular can be episodic and sometimes very hard to capture. And you can increase your percentage of capturing that arrhythmia if the patient has a monitoring device and is having symptoms. So if somebody feels lightheaded, short of breath, palpitations, and they immediately monitor themselves, the chance of catching that intermittent arrhythmia increases by over 40%. And that's a big part of, of you know, what we push is trying to find the balance between 24 seven monitoring, which is difficult and cumbersome and only being monitored when you go to the, to the doctor's office or when you're in your home. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Does anyone else have any questions for, for Bob? Great. Well, well, thank you for, for that perspective. I think now we're going to jump to readout. Um, Jim, could you give, I, I guess, a little more background on readout than you did in the intro? And then also, could you talk a little bit about the, the differences that you've seen between the consumer, clinical, and research spaces? Yeah, sure. Thank you. The, um, so readout essentially was formed to fill a technology gap in the treatment of diabetes. The, the, the device itself is not, it is, uh, does not have an indication for the treatment of diagnosis of type 1 or type 2 diabetes. But a partner of ours that was seeking uh, essentially a, a, a wearable or a handheld device that could give frequent measurements of the state of ketosis um, was what the, what the gap that existed. So um, currently there, there are blood you know, devices that take a, it's called beta, beta hydroxybutyrate or a blood ketone measurement along with the glucose measurement. And um, unfortunately those were once a day measurements and uh, they're not, obviously they're not a non-invasive approach. So so they wanted something that was Bluetooth enabled. Essentially, we created this for this virtual clinic that is reversing diabetes with, uh, with nutritional ketosis, or a, which is a low carb, high fat diet. Keep, keep the keto diet is one of those uh, many things. But if you're putting in that patient uh, into that state of deep, deep fat burn, um, they can reverse diabetes and that's been proven. So obviously the, that has the same impact on obesity. And there certainly is tie into neurodegenerative uh, diseases too. So there's a number of chronic diseases being treated with that nutritional ketosis. Um, so that's why we are formed. Um, the device to, to do that non-invasively, we had to figure out a way to, to have a breath measurement that was equal to and could replace a, a blood measurement. And that's the patent that we have. So we did a clinical trial this past fall in St. Louis, and we had a very strong correlation to breath measurements, uh, breath measurements to blood measurements over the course of the day. So for the first time, these patients and consumers, they they're, they have a behavioral modification tool where they get feedback all day long. So, you know, what's the impact of the food or the exercise on my state of fat burn, if fat burn is the therapy for that chronic disease. And, um, you know, if you don't have feedback, you're not going to have adherence to a protocol. So we provide that adherence tool and that behavioral modification tool, and it really promotes that self-management of that chronic disease or, or just a consumer program. So, so that's, that's why we're in business. And um, we just got our uh, notification that our patent for this deep lung sampling that allows you to, to just use your bottom, really your alveolar exchange of air. That is, uh, that's kind of the, the code that we cracked is using just that sample. So we've, um, breath acetone is the first device. We uh, apply it to, you know, the clinical market segments, uh, academic, as you mentioned, and consumer. And, and there's, they're very different um, in, in some ways. So the academic research side is there's a number of clinical trials. We have a, a big pharma trial coming up uh, for an, an obesity drug called an SGLT inhibitor. Um, that's a top three drug company. We have two cancer trials coming up. Obviously, if you starve cells of glucose, so many targeted therapies are more effective. There's a lot of research going on there right now. So we have two trials uh, upcoming with that, and then a, and a fourth that's in obesity. So um, in the consumer segment, it's pretty straightforward. The, the keto diet and other low-carb diets are um, gaining quite a bit of steam. I mean, you, I, I guarantee everybody knows several people that are doing <laughs> intermittent fasting or the ketogenic diet or some low carb diet. 
So it's very, very common that, that folks are trying to find a way to non-invasively track their, their level of fat burn. Um, and fat burn doesn't mean you're using your, your, your body's stored fat. It could just mean your increased intake of fat. For those of us that are on a low carb, high fat diet, that's your fuel source because your brain and your, your heart um, and skeletal muscle prefer fat as a source of fuel relative to, to carbohydrates. So with that, um, so that's the consumer space. The reality is, though, that the majority of the patients being treated with this kind of, kind of therapy are actually making choices on their own or making purchases on their own at the counsel of a clinician. So there is some gray area in that. Um, you know, we do qualify for RPM codes, remote patient monitoring codes for those clinics that buy devices and then, you know, provide these to the actual patients. And that's an attractive revenue stream for them. But so those are the, the primary differences in the, in the market. It's a real gray area between the patient and consumer though. And I'll stop there. Great, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that perspective. Um, it, can you talk a little bit more? I'm, I'm just curious, what importance have you seen, I guess your handheld device playing in, in clinical research? Yeah. Um, okay. So in clinical research, a lot of these are not going to be diabetics, obviously. I mean, that's just one chronic disease. I mean, diabetics are used to sort of poking themselves and, um, and taking a glucose ketone measurement. Um, but for other chronic diseases, they're, you know, a non-invasive approach where you're, you're tracking a ketone level throughout the day. is just a much more preferred methodology and approach than having a patient, uh, you know, like su such as an obesity study where you're trying to see if they're adherent with the drug. Um, you can tell if they're adherent based on their ketone levels. So right now uh, you've got a lot of companies that are adding sensors, sensor technology to their, their use of their, their uh, um, the therapeutic. And that's to, for a number of reasons is you just don't know if someone's taking their blood pressure. You don't know if they're <laughs> taking their diabetes medication. You just don't have a clue. So providers don't know that. So there's there's ways that you can tell with with sensors. And so in the in these a lot of these research studies, they're they're looking to have an adherence tool. So not only does the patient are, are they reminded that look, I I know that my you know the, the clinical research organization that's helping us, we know that they know. So you're just going to have a much stronger adherence. And the other part of this is is not just Big Brother. It's if if you're getting feedback of what happens when you eat food. Um, as an example for obesity and diabetes, if you're getting feedback within an hour of this is what's happening to my body, um, you're going to, you're going to have a behavioral change. You just don't, people don't have that right now. So they're, you know, they're focused on, I just got to take my medication. You know, I'm diabetic. I just got to give up. I just take my medication. It doesn't have to be that way. You can actually uh, reverse a lot of these conditions and um, through feedback, you're going to have stronger adherence, stronger adherence. You're going to have better outcomes. So that applies to, to all segments that we play in, including the academic space. So. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jim. Um, do we have any other questions for Jim from readout? Great. Well, now let's let's jump over to Nix. Um, Meredith would love to get a little more background on Nix, um, and then also also if you could talk about how you've approached looking at this this consumer versus maybe more clinical grade space. Yeah, happy to. Um, for us, I mean, it, we certainly have an eye to the more medical focused or clinical grade um, biosensor category, which we think, you know, pertinent to this call has enormous potential um, in sort of GDP shifting trends that are happening in, in healthcare. Um, as a small startup, uh, you know, we have a four person team for full time and um, some contractors and others as well. Uh, you know, we felt that that entering the market from a consumer segment first was really wise. Um, low capital intensity, no regulatory risk. Um, you know, quicker to market, and you know, for for the segment that we're in, or or I should say, for the initial application that we're focused on around hydration management and hyperthermia management. 
um, there are some pretty clear segments um, for whom that's a significant problem on the consumer side of the line um, where we can make you know a significant impact um, commercially you know bring in significant revenue and and reinvest that as we work further toward the the more medically focused applications so that was sort of how we thought strategically about you know this balance between consumer um versus versus medical and i think that's a, a model that a lot of folks are thinking about um but for us the the other benefit is that the all of the hardware related development for our our sensor our patch um, does not change whether we're looking at an athlete, a soldier, a firefighter, um, or an elder. Uh, the, so the, the physical patch itself, I should say the, the elder care category, there is a bit of an R&D step there. Um, but we wouldn't have to sort of reinvent two of our three sort of main components um, of our platform. So that was, that was particularly of interest uh, from that perspective. Um, the other question that that pops up frequently is, you know, when we're thinking about our commercial roadmap from athletes to military to laborers, um, I'm not yet 100% convinced, and and this is something that um, I know Bob and I will will probably chat about offline. But I'm not 100% yet convinced that a lot of these labor categories or occupational health categories are 100% bought into the use and and sort of fully open armed embracing of biosensors um, on the job sites on a day to day basis. And there may be, you know, certain segments for whom, uh, you know, it, it's more of an urgent problem to solve when we're talking about hydration and, and hyperthermia. Uh, for example, firefighters may be in that category, but um, you know, we're using our time now, even as we're commercially focused on consumers we're doing pilots with these various occupational groups to also explore that value proposition in, in a lot more detail. Um, so we've been very fortunate that we've had 100% um, inbound uh, sort of unsolicited interest from the occupational health category. We have not been making any sales calls in that direction. Uh, but it also means that we have a bit of a selection bias when we're, when we're talking to these potential partners. Um, such that if I were to pick up the phone and and call, you know, UPS or you know Delta or anyone where they've got people working in more um, extreme conditions, um, I'm not yet 100% convinced that that market segment is quite as mature as the others. So that's kind of how we're thinking about the roadmap, um, and uh, and focusing on the athlete first just gives us you know a, a segment that is really really interested in solving this problem, um, very motivated to do so. And we have from day one uh, built the product to be in a price category um, and sort of in a, in a user experience um, category that makes that segment possible. Because I think that's one other major consideration on this consumer versus medical is you have very, very different consumers of the data um, very different levels of sophistication or education on the data that's coming out uh, on the other end, um, which you know certainly can be addressed. You know we can we can build an app that's more uh, geared toward an athlete and build an app that's more geared toward you know a medical professional. That's not a problem, um, but you know they are they are slightly different uh, use cases from that perspective. So that's how we're thinking about it. Yeah, and, and that's a great perspective to share. I, I, the other question that that kind of brings up is, um, how are you thinking about uh, approaching the consumer? Are you are you thinking to go direct to them, or are you going to try and do sales from business to business to get to the consumer? Um, actually, a bit of a hybrid approach, um, more direct in the short term, um, especially where in the very near term, our focus will actually be on endurance athletes, runners and triathletes and cyclists. Uh, a lot of folks that don't belong in one of those categories think it's an incredibly small and niche category. Um, but companies like Nike and Adidas and, uh, and others would, would beg to differ. It's actually enormous. So, um, so when we think about that category, we are thinking very much about building a consumer facing brand. And this is a very controversial topic as well. You know, if we're gonna go in the direction of a more medically focused 
a company, you know, is that a different brand? Does that happen under, you know, a different corporate entity or a different umbrella? My personal feeling on that after spending my entire career um, in healthcare VC and, and in the healthcare industry and in hospitals is that innovation in the healthcare industry is gonna come from the consumer side first. The healthcare industry, just there are too many stakeholders. The process is too confounded and too challenging uh, for there to be truly revolutionary change. This is just my personal philosophy. Um, but when you have consumer facing brands, and I might argue that for example, even Warby Parker is one of those, um, where you've got this sort of consumer health or consumer wellness uh, sort of category, the consumer, as long as something is priced appropriately and is being delivered to them in a way that makes sense as far as marketing and distribution is concerned, um, and certainly the price point, um, I think you know a company has potential for much sooner and faster scale um, when the target is the consumer. The caveat to that, of course, is, you know, everybody likes a B2B relationship where at least through one touch point, you can sell, you know, greater volume. Um, and there are certainly opportunities to do that in the sports world um, where it's not just, you know, one, one consumer, one sale. Uh, we can do that through teams, um, tournaments, schools, uh, other organizations where they're responsible for, for multiple people with one central decision maker. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. It's really interesting. Um, before we jump um, over to the next uh, solution provider, I actually just got a question from Bruce Sherman. And this, is, this goes out to, to, to all of the solution providers here on the call. Bruce, at, Bruce states, um, I have a question for everyone about data mining from your devices. Kinza Health made a splash with their body temperature approach where they anonymize the data from individuals and provide national mapping of fever incidents. Its ability to track colds and flu nationally became an asset as COVID emerged. Do you think your devices could become a public health asset as well? Maybe I'll, just since I was uh, sort of wrapping up here, maybe I'll address that one first, but very curious to hear what the other yeah. founders um, think. Um, the short answer for us is 100% yes. When we're talking about thermoregulation and dehydration, this is something that has such extreme variability from one individual to the next, and from even within one individual from one day to the next. So, so using population data, um, you know, anonymized in an aggregate to understand what, um, first of all, even just what the range of, of sweat rates and electrolyte loss rates look like and to, to start to be able to understand each individual person's um, relative sensitivity to heat and humidity and altitude and all those other factors that impact thermoregulation. We can actually, um, we already have the, the sort of guts of our machine learning algorithm that can create a predictive model for each individual person such that whether you're an athlete or a, you know, a construction worker or whatever your or a soldier whatever your position happens to be you can our our model can provide a prediction of your fluid and electrolyte needs you know per hour or or whatever the right rate um, whatever the right basis is on a given day given the weather um, forecast for that day which is not only useful for that one individual but if we start to map that more you know certainly nationally and then internationally what we start to understand through population data is how these thermoregulatory patterns vary by age, gender, um, body fat percentage, uh, race. Um, and then certainly, you know, with each degree, you know, Fahrenheit and each percent humidity change, we can start to understand what that looks like. And by applying that predictive model, now be able to understand how much uh, how much work, which I'm sort of putting in air quotes, how much work is somebody going to be able to produce in, you know, given conditions before it starts to become unsafe or before they start to lose productivity? Um, so I, you know, we have talked to many partners from the military to sports teams to the NCAA, 
Um, because the, the fascinating thing about hydration and, and hyperthermia is that we're not just talking about performance, we're talking about safety, we're talking about productivity. And when cognitive or physical impairments are on set, even when my, uh, dehydration levels are extremely mild or hyperthermia levels are mild, um, it becomes a safety issue very quickly if judgment and reaction times are impaired. So sort of a long answer, but, but yes, we are keenly interested in understanding how to use that data on a, on a broader uh, platform. Great, thank you. Any, any other uh, solution provider wanna tackle that question as well? Sure, this is About Bob Frank. Um, what we are doing, and I didn't really get into it, is um, our application to the National Science Foundation is to create a predictive model to alert firefighters when they should come out of a fire, given the parameters that we're measuring, which is heart rate, heart rhythm, skin temperature, environmental temperature. Uh, the newer device will have, uh, have GPS and also the positioning of, of the firefighter. Very much in the, in the way that Meredith was talking about it. Um, I, I'll just a quick and interesting aside is we're partnered with Colorado State University, which has a long history of doing research with firefighters. And interestingly enough, when we have done our focus groups, these firefighters are not surprisingly a, a pretty macho group. And one of the issues with firefighters that, that have, has come up is a lot of the reasons that they die from these cardiovascular events is they don't wanna pull themselves out of the fire. They don't wanna show weakness to their other firefighters. And it was a really interesting perspective that they gave us. And kind of our response to that had been what would be your response if everybody was wearing a device and you got a heads up or a haptic response that said, you know, you need to take a respite for 10 or 15 minutes and then you could come back in. The, the idea being that your fellow firefighters are not gonna have to drag you out of the fire. And it gave a different perspective and their responses to that were a lot more positive than the response of, you know, being the guy who's weak and having to come out of the fire. So I, I'll, I'll keep it brief because I see the clock ticking, but those are some of the insights we have. I would say that, I mean, that exact sentiment, Bob, we've heard also echoed in the military and even in, you know, football teams and, and you know, having an objective measure of when that human being might be starting to get in trouble, you know, putting the onus on someone who's responsible for their health and safety um, is a huge value add for the exact reasons you just described. Great. This has been this has been a great discussion question. Thanks, thanks, Bruce, for your question. Um, I think let's, for the sake of time, let's kind of jump forward. I want to be sure everyone has the chance to speak. Um, Alex, if you want to give a little background on on Norbert Health. Yeah, sure. Uh, just to add a little bit to the previous conversation, which is super interesting. I mean, I totally agree with you guys. I mean, data is really key there in order to build the right predictive models and also patients. I uh, don't know, don't have a clear idea of if they're doing well or not, as, as subjects, if we call them. So we deal with elderly people originally. It's the same same problem, just like with athletes or firefighters. They have a big problem, but they're okay. They don't want people to bother with them or to be worried about them, so they're okay. So you need uh, you need an actual measure to, um, and, 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 and sort of uh, <clears throat> clinical measure to, to understand if they're doing well or not. Uh, and the, the, you know, there's also among everything we're doing there, I think all the companies that are talking today are super interesting. And we all, we all focused on collecting more data about people at a larger scale. And this is all, I mean, the eventual goal of all that is to gather sufficient data and collect sufficient data to be able to implement real preventive medicine, right? Detecting um, early signs of problems and, uh, you know, building models to uh, predict what's going to happen next and prevent problems before they even occur. So um, <clears throat> this is this is also uh, super interesting. Now that one question that is important there too is about privacy and how you handle data, and uh, we're actually faced with that right now. And it's uh, it's a complicated question, of course, and you have to build your whole system around that, around both privacy, of course, HIPAA compliance and other regulatory compliance, but also around the fact that you want third parties to access the data in an anonymized and safe manner. If you don't do that, the data becomes becomes useless, right? So, so it's also a big challenge. 
Um, so yeah, quick presentation on Norbert. Uh, I'm actually not tied over there because we, we're not a wearable. <laughs> we're actually a company trying to replace a wearable um, in the, in the, originally in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the area of uh, elderly monitoring. So um, there's uh, nine, 9 million people living home alone, elderly people living home alone in the US uh, who have some kind of uh, clinical, some kind of medical condition. And uh, you know, almost all of them have the risk of falling. So falling and rapid decline of health with an elderly person who lives home alone is, is, a, is a massive risk and a massive concern for families too. So uh, currently when you know, a family or caregiver has a patient in that situation, they will buy a purse, uh, you know, personal emergency response system, which is usually a wearable, something you put around your neck, on your wrist, uh, that essentially monitors falls, some vital signs sometimes, and has a button to call for help. So these devices, they were great and they've made a lot of progress recently, but there's one essential problem, which is the person who wears them is not the person who directly benefits from them, right? The person who wears them, who has to put them on and charge them is the elderly person, but the data goes to the caregiver or the family, right? So there's a, there's a disconnect there. And the result of that is that the penetration rate of these devices is very low. 5% of the people who are going to fall or are going to have a health problem at home when they're, when they're older, 65 or older, only 5% of them have one of these devices. And out of these 5%, only 2% of them use them. So the two thirds churn uh, on these devices. So that's how we came up with the idea of Norbert. Um, you know, of course, at the same time, we saw the rapid progress of um, contactless and distant um, vital sign measurement using radar technology, infrared technology. So we built a device um, that has an infrared sensor, two radars and a camera that's able to collect uh, temperature uh, with a pretty high accuracy, uh, heart rate, heart rate variability. So, you know, uh, cardiac and, and vascular activity. We also do PPG uh, and uh, remote PPG, of course. And we do, uh, we do a breathing analysis. So we detect coughs, cl classify coughs, different kinds of coughs with a microphone and understand the mechanical uh, activity of the, of the chest. So <clears throat> we can do that uh, within a range of about three meters, like 10, 12 feet around the device. Uh, we also do fall detection using another kind of radar that covers a whole home, right? We can do bigger movement detection basically using, a, using that radar um, that, that see through walls, uh, can cross two, three walls in a regular home, like drywall walls, uh, and will cover a radius of 12 meters. So if you have a regular sized apartment, it's going to work. If you have a bigger house, you're going to need a couple of devices, but, uh, essentially it, it, uh, it's one device per home. Um, our approach is to go direct to consumer, uh, because the market is structured this way. Uh, and my partner is, uh, has a big track record in consumer electronics. He's the guy who started the Arlo camera. So uh, he has the um, right approach and connection with ODMs, so manufacturers, but also distributors to build a successful uh, large scale consumer product. But we're consumer grade, we're also medical grade, right? If you wanna provide accurate and useful data, you still have to go through FDA approval, right? If you claim to measure temperature or heart rate variability or breathing rate, you have to get FDA stamp. So uh, we're both consumer grade and, uh, and medical grade. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, and I know the clock is ticking, is uh, we have a lot of traction right now from enterprises um, in implementing system to monitor the data, the, the health of employees getting back to work. And this is really important and it's a massive trend that will probably be there to stay. So we're actually building a specific version of our product for enterprise settings. Great. Absolutely. Very, very exciting stuff, Alex. Um, I'm looking at the time and I see that, that, that we're kind of approaching the, the top of the hour. Blake or, or Thomas, do either of you have a really hard stop? I can I can flex a bit and, and keep going. Okay, great. Yeah, me too. Um, in that case, okay, perfect. Um, well, I, I I think for time, um, thank you, Alex. I think I think let's jump jump a little into um, our next speaker. Let's have um, Blake if you could talk give a little background on your company, um, and then also maybe talk about some of the benefits you've seen in in having patients report their their own data data. 
Absolutely, and I'll keep this really, um, really brief. So CareSignal, uh, from a risk stratification perspective, as well as a financial return perspective, is designed to fall below the initial investment required for devices, right? So we're a no device solution. Um, so, you know, other term is bring your own, you know, bring your own technology um, because we use text messages and phone calls uh, uh, with patients existing uh, cell phones or landline phones. Um, the, uh, you know, the problem that I think we're all uh, solving in one way or another is, um, you know, how best to deliver return on investment. And that means balancing technology with patient population with, of course, the value and, you know, ideally the proprietary nature of the, of the solution itself. Um, our approach, um, and, and Hannah, you did a great job summarizing uh, this in the couple of bullets there. Our approach is to take a, um, a condition specific uh, uh, set of solutions, set of programs, and create a portfolio that allows us to align strategically with the needs and uh, focus areas of a health system or a payer. Um, and right now we're at about a 70% health system, 30% um, payer breakdown in terms of our customer base and patient population. Um, we handle the enrollment. Uh, of patients onto this new program or members onto this new program. Um, and then we route the, um, um, the patient generated health data uh, back to the appropriate clinical capability on the side of the provider or the payer so that they can reach out and leverage their existing clinical capabilities, but also relationships in following up with the right patient at the right time. Um, and as a final thought, I'll walk you through um, exactly as I would a healthcare executive our approach to really defending our return on investment. Um, we have 10 peer reviewed journal publications showing for more than one dozen uh, discrete conditions, including all of the big chronics, COPD, diabetes, hypertension, depression, uh, uh, that CareSignal not only uh, uh, engages patients more effectively than other comparable solutions, keeping, keeping depending on the population, 50 to 80% of patients engaged for a full year, uh, it also, we are also able to show clinical improvements in randomized controlled trials, including multi-center uh, prospective trials uh, that, that account for the Hawthorne effect, um, essentially a placebo group. And then we've corroborated those clinical outcomes with claims data uh, with uh, our um, customer partners across the country, analyzing their own records with cohort style analyses and published on that. So I know that I can take a large population, I can engage it quickly, I can keep those patients engaged, I can drive clinical outcomes for every one of those patients in the conditions that matter, and I can prove that those outcomes lead to dollars in the pocket of the customer. Um, and at the end of the day, that's, that's really what, uh, what sets us apart. Um, and I think that's also what's necessary. I mean, healthcare is full of good ideas, um, but uh, the, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the rubber meeting the road that can be the challenge. Yeah, absolutely, and and thanks for for sharing that perspective on on aligning value with with the the healthcare executives. Um, just want to thank anyone who has to jump off at this time if they have a hard stop. Um, I think we're going to keep going for a few more minutes because um, we'd love to to speak also with Thomas. Um, but Blake, um, one question that I that I have for you, I, I guess I wonder, do you also do you also how did you think about the the question from Bruce? about um, devices being part of pu public health assets, assets, excuse me. Devices being public health assets. I mean, I think as with all of this, this is all a means to an end, right? The end is, mm -hmm. is outcomes that affect dollars. Um, it, it's interesting, the public health side, that's essentially another end um, that, that, that could be benefited. Uh, in the case of care signal, um, that's, a hard, that's a hard pass for us. Um, you know, from a data strategy perspective, we, we don't distribute anonymize and sell, anonymize and use any data. Um, it all is retained and owned by our partners. Um, and um, yeah, that would, that would, that would preclude us from, from doing anything like that. Uh, but I could definitely see uh, value in that if a company is, is, is able to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Blake. Oops. Here we go. Um, Thomas, now that we going to, moving on to you, um, would love a little background on, on cross technology solutions. Um, and then also because of your kind of unique perspective of being a platform that can host 
different um, sensors and bio devices. I, I would love your perspective on some of the challenges you've you've faced with sensors on your platform. Yeah, first of all, uh, uh, I need to say that we've been working with this for quite some years. We are a clinical grade and we uh, mostly have two parts. It's a patient uh, application and uh, we of course have a medical interface. And what we do is changing healthcare from the inside because we're ending the calendar-based care to need space. And we are helping the clinics work with the sharing of the data where the problem starts at the hospital or the clinic. So we automatically grade patients' medical uh, needs. And that helps the healthcare provider, especially when we are working with patient groups of tens of thousands of patients working with us. And uh, we use sensor data, of course, and we apply it for different types of, of healthcare conditions, like all types of heart conditions. It's from um, myocardial, myocardial infarction, heart failure, and uh, LVAD patients, patients with mechanical hearts or transplanted uh, patients. We work with all pulmonary-related problems like COPD and so on. And also with the multi-chronical patients, uh, because we are, since we are a platform, we create a coherent interface for the patients instead of using different types of uh, apps. So we create a coherent, and that is very important to keep the patient uh, going, so to say. And uh, what we do, we, we use sometimes sensor data, sometimes we do not. And the driver for the sensor data is actually the medical need of the sensor data. And we only work with medical grade sensors because we are addressing uh, the, the government run clinics and hospitals and private ones. And since that is the more professional market, they need to be medically graded. And um, I think it's important also to say that we have been working with sensor for quite some time. And sometimes the sensors are not good enough for us to use. If you have a, a meta example to Hannah when we spoke earlier, uh, it was around the weight scales. It's very important that you know who is on the weight scale. Is it the, the, the actual patient or is it the husband or wife or a visitor and so on. And since we're working with fast moving data, because we're capturing a healthcare condition that is going uh, sort of, you can say, worse. And we call it action data. We didn't find any good name for it. Uh, everybody was talking about big data. Big data is often more slow. Uh, this is uh, here and now data, action that needs to be taken now, in this very day or hour, not within weeks, months, or quarters. And we do that not by using alarm, uh, sending alarms to, to the healthcare provider, but we're working in a different way with the clinics. So we create no alarm fatigue. And um, we divided the data that we uh, retrieve from the patients, and we call it priority data that we use to calculate medical priority. And, this is also why we need medical graded sensors, because otherwise we cannot use it if we are not sure on the integrity of the data. And then we divided another group of data that we call relevant data, that is other information around the patient uh, that is necessary to know if the priority data triggers something for, for a patient. And we work with it we can say a triage that automatically grade patients and it works like an elevator. So when the clinic starts, you always see the patients in the most need on top of that medical interface. And of course we use medical data from inside the clinics that could be different sorts of, uh, of um, tests that has been performed and so on, or clinical data that is used 
by or generated by the patient. So this is in short. Uh, our experience is that we uh, see that the pricing of the sensors is the biggest problem when you should scale up the, the business. If you have tens of thousands of patients or hundreds of thousands of patients, there's always a question who's going to pay for the sensors. So that's one of the struggles that we do have. And uh, most of the interventions that we have done uh, or the healthcare professionals are using the system because we are not sort of, uh, we are not the resources uh, that works with the medical interface. That is the clinics and the hospitals. I've actually acted on other information than uh, sensor data. That does not mean that sensor data is not important. It is where it's medically motivated. And why we say this is due to the pricing of the sensors. Yeah, absolutely. So this is and, uh, and what we for... ensure we're working with. Yes, absolutely. Um, and and I have a kind of a follow up question, but I'm since we're running kind of short on time, I'm going to also open it up to um, Blake and and Jim, if they or or if they're interested in also or Alex, if they're also interested in answering. Um, I, I guess I'm curious, what are some of the challenges that you've seen? with data itself and its privacy and storage. Sure, this is Blake, I can take a quick stab. Um, the, the more money you're willing to pay, the fewer challenges you face. Um, everything from SOC 2 type two um, um, audits and, and, uh, and multi-principal approval uh, to hosting on you know, providers such as Armor instead of trying to go through AWS and and you know, get customers to trust that yeah, the BAA will actually hold water. Um, the, you know, my my advice would sincerely be spend more to save yourself a, a world of headache when you get um, tough questions and have to go through 500 page security intakes with uh, you know top um, industry players. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree with, with Blake there. I mean, you know, the the the, the whole HIPAA compliance is a is a big mess, and you have to pick the right <clears throat> the right partner. But uh, I mean, it it it's it's a uh, it's a long process, but it's pretty deterministic. And yeah, if you have the right partner, it's going to work better. I think there's another topic that that's coming up is how do you, how do you exchange data between providers? You know, the patients, uh, the payers. Uh, there are some some startups that are tackling that issue right now. You're offering platform that that basically offer attribute-based encryption systems where you can give access to some derivative of the data to some player uh, for a limited amount of time, and you have a very granular um, uh, you know access to the data. That, that's also super super useful, and that I would say it's a different topic. And um, so we just we were just faced like last week with uh, some new guidelines in the return to work applications coming from uh, from uh, New York State because we're based in New York, and um, so we're not allowed to store any um, medical data from any uh, employees um, with with a return to work application. So that's pretty clear. <laughs> we'll have to figure out a way to make it work because we still need. I mean, these application and employers still need to understand if someone is is sick within their within their uh, workspace. So there's a uh, we're going to have to be creative about that. Great. And yeah, and we thank also you all have for... encountered. Go ahead, Thomas. Yes, who... Yeah, yeah, yes, a short one. Uh, since we are based in Europe and uh, in Sweden, we have uh, the problem for us is if we use uh, sensors or store data, the Cloud Act is a problem for us due to, to the legislation around that. So, so that's our biggest challenge. Great, and, and thank you all for sharing that perspective and, and thank you for joining us today. I think since we're, we're running over, I'm gonna move forward. But before I do that, does anyone else have any other questions or comments before I wrap this up and summarize?
Great. Well, thank you. Thank you all for joining today. I think this has been a, a great discussion with a, a real variety of solution providers with great perspectives. Uh, in general, the, the areas of opportunity in wearables and the platforms that support them are really immense. Um, advances in technology and communications have positioned wearables to provide value to improve chronic disease management and, and support con consumer health. Um, additionally, large companies are working to capture market share in data and wearable space and digital health, which opens them to acquire a lot of these smaller and, and, and valuable data bits. Um, additionally, the convenience of data collection opens the doors for us to really advance our knowledge in healthcare um, and also more easily facilitate holding clinical trials. Um, some of the challenges which we, we touched on today include um, some challenges with, with high cost for devices that could worsen healthcare disparities. Um, privacy for patients is certainly an ongoing challenge that needs to be addressed. Um, additionally, data laws are different across regions, so that's something that we all have to think about. Um, in addition, some devices, there may be challenges with, with reading them or, or the noise associated. Um, and then one other question that, that a lot of this access to data raises is will data from wearables be used to penalize policyholders with, with either higher premiums or insurance denial? So these are all um, things to think about. Um, before we end here, thank you all for joining. Um, does anyone have any additional questions or comments? Perfect. Well, thank you all for joining this deep dive today, and I think this has been a, a great discussion. So thank you.